Welcome back into our class BI 210 on how to study the Bible. Remember, we're in our third module, and we left off talking about how Revelation is progressing through the Bible. We're talking about the progress of Revelation from Genesis all the way to Malachi in the canonical Bible, not the chronological. And we're looking at now, and we studied that in our last session. Now what we want to do is look at the New Testament. We want to look at the canonical New Testament, which the way it's laid out for us, Matthew to Revelation. But that's not how exactly it was written chronologically. So we're talking about the progress of Revelation. Actually, let's look at the New Testament now. And, and we're going to be looking at the book uh, approximately when it was written okay, and who is the author. So that we get an idea of how to approach the Word of God. Now, when we start with the New Testament, it does not start with the, with the book of Matthew, the way it's formatted in our present day canonical Bible. What we have is the book of Galatians. Okay? So we're going to have James and Galatians and Matthew, Mark and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So let me show you how this works. So what we're going to have is the first book is the book, the first book of the, of the New Testament is actually James. James. Okay? And that's James is written somewhere between the period of AD 44 through AD 49, somewhere in that time period, and the author is James. Then what follows is the book of Galatians, Galatians, and that book is written somewhere about the time period of 49 and 50 AD, and is written by the Apostle Paul. And then we come to the book of, finally, the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and that's written somewhere in the period between 50 and 60 AD. It's somewhere in that time period, and that was written by Matthew. Then we have the book of Mark, Mark, okay? and that's the Gospel of Mark, and it's written also sometime in the period between 50 and 60 A.D., and that's also written by Mark, who's an associate of, right, right, of Peter. And James, as we know, is James, okay, is a brother of Jesus. Then we get to 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is written somewhere around the year period of A.D. 51, and that's written by the Apostle Paul. And then 2 Thessalonians is written somewhere between 50 and 52, 51 and 52, that's written by Paul. And then we go to, we get to 1 Corinthians. We're giving you a chronological flow of the, pro, of the progress of Revelation in the New Testament. And so we get the first Corinthians, and that's written about A.D. 55. That's written by the Apostle Paul. And then you get the second Corinthians. That's written between A.D. 55 and 56. That's also written by the Apostle Paul. And then we get to the book of Romans. Romans, and that's written somewhere in the time period of A.D. 56. That's written by the Apostle Paul. And you can see how this makes sense in terms of the progress of Revelation and how Revelation just weaves itself through the New Testament and it matches up exactly with world history. And then after the book of Romans actually comes the book of Luke. Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Right? And that's written somewhere in the time period of AD 60, 61. And this is written by the by the by the uh, Luke, who's an associate of Paul. We know Mark was an associate of Peter. Luke is an associate of Paul. And then after the book of Luke comes the book of Ephesians. And that's written somewhere between a period of A.D. 60 and A.D. 62. That's also written by the Apostle Paul. And then after Ephesians comes the book of Philippians. Philippians. And that is also written somewhere about A.D. 60 to 62. That's written by the Apostle Paul. And then we have the book of Colossians. And that's written also somewhere in the time period of 60 to 62. Okay? That's written by the Apostle Paul. And then we get to the book of Philemon. And Philemon is a Philemon is a book that's written also sometime between 60 and 62, and that's written by the Apostle Paul. So if you just follow it chronologically, how things happen in what order, um, it matches up with the experiences of all the missionary trips of the Apostle Paul. And that's also written by Paul. Then as after that comes the book of Acts. Um, and I know that's kind of like it's it's kind of uh, uh, out of sync for a lot of us because 
we tend to believe when we open our modern day Bibles, we open it up, right? And we see Genesis, and we go all the way to Malachi, and, we, and in our heads, we think that's the chronological order. No, that's the canonical order. The canonical order is how it was formatted and put so in, 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 its, in its historical, in its contextual setting. So we have the law, that's the first five books of the Bible, right? That's so we, we get Genesis, we, right? We get Exodus, uh, we get uh, um, 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 Numbers, Leviticus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? And so that it's just put together as the Pentateuch, as the law. Then we get all of the historical books, okay? And, and after that, you know, we go from Joshua all the way to what we would call, okay, what we would call uh, uh, Nehemiah, right? And then we get the books of wisdom, right? Starting with the book of, of Job and all the way through. And then after you get the Job, okay, then we begin with the prophets, right? The, the major prophets and the minor prophets, okay? So it's just, that's just the way it was formatted, okay? Now, but that's not the progress of Revelation. We had the same issue in the New Testament. So we left off with the book of Philemon, right? Now, so that Philemon was written somewhere between A.D. 60 and 62. That's written by the Apostle Paul. Now comes the book of Acts. Now comes the book of Acts. Okay, now. Um, and um, really, to, to grasp the understanding of, of uh, the book of Acts, okay, you really have to study that with the Ephesians, Colossians, okay? Uh, you have to study that with, 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 with Romans and Corinthians, okay? And Thessalonians. And then you get a really understanding of the book of Acts, okay? So the book of Acts is written somewhere by A.D. 62, and that's written also by Luke, okay? Who's an associate of Paul. Then after the book of Acts comes the first book of Timothy, 1 Timothy. Okay? And that's written somewhere in the time period between 62 and 64 AD, and that's written by the Apostle Paul. Then we get the book of Titus. If we're going to look at the progress of Revelation or the chronology of it, so it, the next book will be Titus, and that's written between 62 and 64 AD. That's written also by Paul. Then right after that, we get the first book of Peter, the first book of Peter. And that's written between A.D. 64 and A.D. 65. Right? And that's written by Peter. After that comes the second, the second book of Timothy. The second book of Timothy. And that's somewhere between 66 and 67 A.D. And that's written, obviously, by Paul. And then after that, we get to Second Peter. And Second Peter is written somewhere between 67 and 68 A.D. And that's okay. And that's written by Peter. And then we get the Book of Hebrews. Is when we get we see the Book of Hebrews. And Hebrews is somewhere in a time period about 67 and 69 A.D. And we really don't know who the author is. Now there's all kinds of speculations who people think the author is, but we really officially do not know. Okay. And then after the Book of Hebrews comes the Book of Jude comes the book of Jude, okay? And after Jude, all right, okay, comes a Jude, and we that's written somewhere between 68 and 70 AD, Jude, okay? And that's written by Jude himself. Then we get the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John, okay, um, is it comes somewhere in a time period... 80 and 90 AD, so you could see that you could see the time frame from AD 33 when Jesus Christ dies, he goes to the cross, and from AD 33 you just follow almost to get to the end of the first century. So by the time you get to the year 80 to 89, this is when we get the Gospel of John, and that's written by John, and then we get First John. First John is written. Much later, somewhere between the period of 90 and 95, and we're approaching the end of the first century. So this is about 
90 to 95, that's 1 John. 2 John is also written somewhere after that, 90 to 95. And then 3 John is also written after that, somewhere between 90 and 95. And that's also authored by John. And then we get the last book, is called the Book of Revelation, the Apocalypse. That is the Revelation. And that's, that's the last book before we close the end of the first century. And that's written somewhere between the period of 94 and 96 AD, written by also the Apostle John, because John is the last living apostle by the time we get to the end of the first century. So that kind of gives you an idea how this flows. Now, so we continue uh, to talk about the issue of how to study the Bible. Well, I want to give some tips or some clues or some uh, points here on how to get the most out of the study of this divine handbook that we call Holy Writ, Holy Scripture, the Word of God. I want to talk to you about that. Okay? Um, and these pointers, I think, will help you. I think will help answer uh, some of the more critical kinds of questions uh, uh, of all. Okay, And so we, let, we start out with, like, how can a young man... Um, how can a young man keep his ways pure? Um, and the psalmist begins to respond to those kinds of issues. He says, by keeping it according to your word. And so now we get into some of the practical kinds of questions here. Turn your Bibles to the book of Psalm 119, verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. And notice what he says. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word word. We come to another question. So why is it important? Why is it even important to study the Bible? I, I can grasp, I can understand why, um, why unbelievers uh, may think that way. I can even grasp and understand why religious people think that way because um, uh, who are not born again, they just happen to be religious. But the pain of actually hearing this, having traveled extensively to different countries around the world to preach and teach the gospel, the full counsel word, to train pastors, is how many pastors have seemingly come up with the attitude as to why is it important for me to study the whole Bible? And every time we ask this question you know, uh, about who's studying the Bible, it's pretty amazing to me to see how many of them don't see the importance of studying the Bible. So they just pick and choose, and they pick here and they pick there, and they come up with a with a with a three point sermonette uh, message and blah blah blah. It, look, really, the question is why why is God's word so important? You know, it, it, why is it important to study the Bible? They kind of wrestle with that question, and so then I ask the question: So why is God's word so important? Why is it? And I you know, go, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you just asked me the question. Why is it important to study the Bible? And then I said, well, let me, allow me, please, to answer that with another question. And let's get into the details of this. Okay? And my question is, why is God's word so important? Or is it? Or is it not? Okay? Well, I think at some point you have to acknowledge, if you're honest, yeah, it is important. Well, why is it important? I'll tell you why. Because it, it, it because the Bible is God's mind. It's his mind. Okay? It's God's mind and will for your life, for my life, for our life. That's why it, God's word is so important, because it's God's mind and his will for our lives. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And look at this in verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 and 17, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because we come to the conclusion that it is the only source of absolute divine authority for you as a servant of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I just said to you, preacher? I'm talking to you. It is the only source of absolute divine authority for you okay, as a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it reads as follows. All scripture is inspired by God 
and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, so why is it important? Because it is infallible in its totality. The Word of God is infallible in its totality. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to the book of Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. The law of the the law of the Lord is uh, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Why is the word of the Lord so important? Because it is inerrant, okay, in its part. It's inerrant in its parts. Okay? Look at this. So every single part of it, from Genesis to Revelation, Revelation back to Genesis, every single one of its 66 parts, okay, and all of its subparts, in, in, as you break down every single book of the Bible, okay, are inerrant. Look what he says in the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 30, look what he says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6 says this. Every word of God is tested. Did you hear that? Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be, rep and you will be proved a liar. Why is God's word so important? Because it's complete. It is absolutely complete. Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 22. And in the book of Revelation chapter 22, let's look at this verse 18 and 19. And this is one of the key things about learning how to study the Bible. You teach and you repeat. You teach and you repeat. And you teach and you repeat until it becomes ingrained in us. In the book of Revelation chapter 22, it tells us in verse 18 and 19, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life. God will take his part away from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. This book is complete. So why is this why is the Bible so important? Well, because it is all off uh, it is um author to, uh, uh, authoritative. It is authoritative and it is final. It is uh, uh, authoritative. It is authoritative and it, it is final. Mm -hmm. Turn your Bibles to the book of Psalm, chapter 119. And look at this in chapter 119 of the book of Psalms. I want you to see this with me. Mm -hmm. And look at what he says here in verse uh, 89. In verse 89, look at this. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Do you see that? The word of God is settled in heaven. That's where it's settled. So it is authoritative and it is complete. So why is the Word of God so important? Why is the Bible so important? Well, because it is totally sufficient for your needs. It is totally sufficient for all of our needs. Look what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And look at what he says in verse 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Look at these four things. For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. See, it is totally authoritative, and it is, okay, and to meet all of your needs. Why is the word of God so important? Well... Because it will accomplish what it promises. See, that, that is what the, one of the most profound things about the Word of God. It actually achieves. It actually fulfills. It actually completes. It actually accomplishes all that it promises to do. 
In the book of Isaiah chapter 55, please turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. Look at what he says in verse 11. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Look at what he says. Without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter in which I send it. Boom. It says absolutely everything okay, that it is. Again, so why is the word of God so important? Why? Man? Because it provides what? It provides the assurance of your salvation. It provides the assurance of our salvation, those who are believers. Turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. And in John, chapter 8, I want you to go to verse uh, 47. John, chapter 8, verse 47, and look what he says. He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. John chapter 20 and in John chapter 20 we see this in verse 31 in John 20 31 he says but these have been written so that you may believe what that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name why is it important to study the Bible because it is infallible in its totality. Why is it important to study the Bible? Because it is inerrant in all of its parts. Why do I study the Bible? Because it is complete. Why is it important to study the Bible? Because it is authoritative and final. Why is it important to study the Bible? Because it, 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 it is totally sufficient for our needs. Why, study, why is it important to study the Bible? Because it will accomplish what it promises. Why, study, why is it important to study the Bible? Because it provides the assurance of our salvation. So we come to the next logical question, okay? Or the next sequential question. How will I benefit from studying the Bible? That's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. Listen. Now I want you to think about it like this. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. Turn your Bibles there. Because when we ask a question like this, okay, how will I benefit from, from studying the Bible? We have to acknowledge and recognize that millions and millions and millions of pages of material are printed every week around the world. Thousands and thousands of new books are published each month around the world. This will not be surprising to Solomon. Do you you think that we've kind of outpaced the new the 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 the, the Old Testament and the New Testament? You think we did that? No, no. Let me show you something. Out of the millions and millions and millions of pages that are published, you know, every week, and the, and the thousands upon thousands of books that are published every month, okay, Solomon understood that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12, he says this. But beyond this, my son, be warned. Notice this. This is, this is, this is a warning. We're being averted to something. He says, be, but beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless. And excessive devotion to books is wearing, wearing to the body. Miss Solomon understood this issue. Even with today's wealth uh, of all the books and, 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 and all of the computer helps that we have today, okay, the Bible remains the only source of divine revelation and the power that can sustain Christians in their daily walk with God. Now I want you to note these significant promises in Scripture, you know, because one of the questions: Well, what's the benefit of me studying the Bible? I mean, what's the benefit? I mean, what do I get out of this? Okay, well, turn your Bibles to John chapter seventeen, verse seventeen. In John chapter seventeen, verse seventeen, see this with me. Okay, 
Because begin with, you have to understand, is that the Bible is the source of truth. Yes, uh, I want you to understand that the Bible is absolute truth. Did you hear what I said? The Bible is, the, this is exclusive truth. And I realize that you and I live, live in, in a time frame, okay? Um, uh, uh, let me just grab one of my Bibles here because I tend to keep three, four Bibles here with me because I'm reading from different uh, versions. But let me, let me say this to you so that you have a very clear understanding, okay? Um, uh, yes, we actually, we actually uh, dare to proclaim that the Bible, okay, is the only exclusive truth on earth today. In fact, the Bible has been the only exclusive truth on earth yesterday, today, and forevermore. In an era where exclusivity is rejected, we are exclusive. So why, what is the benefit that I receive? What is the benefit that I receive from studying Bible? Well, because this is the only source of truth. Did you hear what I'm saying? It's the only source of truth. Look, in John 17, 17, he says this sanctify them in John chapter 17 verse 17 he said sanctify them in the truth your word is truth do you see that well what's the benefit do I get from studying the Bible well the Bible is the source of God's blessings when obeyed I mean you actually have to have something radical in your life like obedience and you have to obey that truth we just spoke about so Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 11. And I want you to see in the book of Luke chapter 11. And see this with me in verse 28. Luke chapter 11 verse 28. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. In other words, obey it. What is the benefit of my studying the Bible? Well, the Bible is the source of victory. Is the only source of victory that we actually have. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Look at what it says. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the only way we're going to have victory. Okay? And then, why am I, what is the benefit of me studying Bible? Well, it's good, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I get these kinds of questions, you know, repeatedly, look. And, and it's because the Bible is the source of growth. And listen, you're, the only way to grow as a believer, and the only way to grow as a, 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 as a pastor, uh, you know, as a preacher, and a teacher of the Word of God, okay, is that you have to come to the Word of God. And the Bible is the only source of growth. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, I want you to see this with me. And Peter says this, Like newborn babies how, who long desire, yearn for the pure milk of the word, so that by it, so that by it, by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Do you see that? What is the benefit of me studying the Bible? Well, the Bible is the source of power. It's the only true source of power. Turn your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1. And in the book of Romans, chapter 1, I want you to see verse 16. In Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am, this is the Apostle Paul, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What's the benefit of me studying the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible is the source of guidance. It's the only true source of guidance. In the book of Psalm 119, verse 105, in the book of Psalm 119, verse 105, says this, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So I want you to note these significant promises in the Scripture. 
The Bible is the source of truth. The Bible is the source uh, is the source of God's blessings when we actually obey. The Bible is the source of victory. The Bible is the source of growth. The Bible is the source of power. The Bible is the source of guidance. That's what those are the benefits that you and I receive when we study the Word of God.